Hello, my name is Lindsay Wyrick, and you're listening to the Frugal Crafter Podcast, where this week I'm asking, how green is your craft? It used to be that when we would craft, we would use stuff we had around the house, we would recycle things, and we would find clever ways to use everyday objects in new and inventive ways. But lately, uh, it has gone in a completely other direction. I've been thinking about this topic a lot over the past 10 years, mainly because um, I run a blog and YouTube channel and I'm constantly bringing projects out for folks to do at home. And I love to do recycled projects, but I find that a lot of those recycled crafts, those projects don't tend to do as well as projects that are made with more commercially available supplies. So that's been something that I've been thinking about a lot. I love to cr come up with really clever ways to use plastic bottles and glass jars and cardboard and things like that. But there's only seems to be so many things you can do with that and have them look um, sophisticated and classy and things that my audience would be looking to do. But I, but I keep that in mind a lot because I want to leave less trash, I want to consume less, and I want to set a good example for creative folks, whether they are constricted by the supplies they have available to them or their budget. I want everyone to be able about how I used to craft compared to how I craft now. And I definitely made a lot more of DIY supplies or I bought more kind of basic materials that I could use in a variety of different ways. And uh, over the years, as my budget has gotten a little bit larger, I have tried new products. And um, one of the things that's become very popular on my blog and YouTube channel have been product reviews. And I benefit from having the blog and YouTube channel in the respect that a lot of companies will send me products to try out. And um, on the on one hand, it can help people save money by purchasing the products or avoiding the products that don't work for them and purchasing ones that will work for them. So hopefully people don't have piles and piles of unused art supplies or craft supplies in their stash. But on the other hand, I wonder if it may encourage people to buy things that they don't necessarily need because, or would it even have known about if it wasn't for a video review and it contributes to more consumption. I don't know. It's really hard to identify these things when you're so close to it. So I was thinking about how I used to craft. And for instance, I was always, um, I was always a painter. I was a painter before I started crafting in watercolor and oils mainly um, and color pencils too. And then after I had um, my first child, I started scrapbooking and then I would make cards with the leftovers from my scrapbook pages. So my process would go like this. I would um, make a scrapbook page and then I would have some scraps left over. So I would make a card. And then if I had tiny scraps left over, I might punch out embellishments with paper punches and um, for the teeny tiny scraps that I couldn't really punch anything out of or die cut anything out of, I don't even know if I had a die cutter back then. I probably didn't. Uh, for those tiny little scraps, I would put them in large Ziploc bags um, sorted by color. And then once I had a bag full, I would make paper and I would make sheets of handmade paper with those, uh, with those leftover scraps. And it was fun. It was something I could do with, um, with classes. Cause I used to teach art to kids and adults. It was something I could do with my kids mixed media class and it was fun. Um, but as I was doing that on my own, after I closed my studio down, I realized I rarely use the paper that I made. So I was saving these little scraps for a long period of time until I finally made paper with them and then the paper just sat there. I usually didn't have a project to do with that handmade paper. And to be honest, it wasn't as nice as the paper I had that was purchased, um, you know, from uh, from craft stores and stuff. So I, I found that I didn't use it because I didn't like the looks that I got with it. It wasn't as professional looking as I wanted it to. And it just, um, you know, so a lot of times it would fade or just get kind of like, be kind of like um, yellowed or grayed down because of the colors and the papers that I'd mixed together. So I, I decided to stop saving those little scraps to make paper with. So what did I do with the scraps? Well, to be honest, a lot of those ended up in the trash can. I mean, I might throw some in the fire pit if I was, if uh, like my husband had a campfire going in the backyard when I was cleaning up, but for the most part, it went in the trash. And um, I guess I got a little bit more, um, I started treating my time as a more precious resource than the leftover scraps. And it occurred to me that, um, that a lot of the crafts that are made today are not utilizing scraps. When you think of like quilting, um, a lot of times quilts used to be made from 
leftovers. They would be made from old clothing that could no longer be worn. It was too threadbare. They would cut the good portions out of clothing and make quilts with it, make heirloom quilts. But then also among upper echelons of society, they would be purchasing new fabric to make quilts. So it was almost kind of like um, like two different classes of craftspeople. You had the the homemakers and the kind of working middle class crafters that would that would reuse and make things from scraps. And uh, it would be both a utilitarian project. It would be something that was going to help stretch a family budget. You've got some blankets that you can use. You've got pretty things. It was also part of the entertainment budget. You were um, doing something, being useful, also having a good time. So it was money you weren't spending on entertainment. And um, it was also something you could do with your kids. It was a way to educate your kids and teach your kids to be resourceful and creative. And um, I think those are all really good things, honestly, especially as we're looking at our throwaway society and the fact that you could go and buy a, uh, a quilt or comforter or a blanket from a big box, store, big box store and have it fall apart and have threads come out of it in a year or two. Whereas if you made something by hand, even if it was made from scraps, it's probably going to be a higher quality and be much nicer, plus have the memories that um, from all of the bits and bobs that you've put into it. I love crazy quilts for that reason. And um, and I love the, the fact that when you make something from scraps, you literally have something that nobody else is going to have have in the world. So if you're digging through bags of your children's old clothes and you're using leftovers from different projects that you have and buttons and different things like that, and you sew that together in a quilt, you can guarantee nobody else is going to have the exact same quilt that you've just made. So that's, I feel like, where my crafting journey came from. Growing up, we were always encouraged to recycle and, and make things out of nothing, basically, uh, save jars and uh, save cardboard and do different things like that to make our projects, to make our art with. And we did have some commercially available supplies, but the supplies that were available were usually quite expensive. There was an art store in a neighboring city and everything was full retail. In fact, this is something I've discussed in an earlier pod podcast about how art supplies have, have not really seen inflation compared to other things in our economy. When I think about those first two watercolor brushes my mother bought me when I was seven and taking my first watercolor class, I still have them. There was a $20 Aquarelle brush. It was a half inch flat. You can buy a brush identical to that now for about six bucks. Um, and there was um, actually there was two rounds. There was a round mop and there was a round uh, number six um, detail brush from Grumbacher. And I think that brush was probably $10 and you can buy an equivalent for about $3 now. And the mop, I think you'd probably buy an equivalent of that for like $5. And I think it was like eight or $9 back in 1982 when my mom bought it for me. So I commented on how art supply stores really haven't seen the inflation that other products have, but that was a lot of money back then. And you weren't going to excessively buy art supplies when you have to pay top dollar for them. When you're looking at, you know, a day's pay to buy um, some brushes and a tube of watercolor, you're not going to be excessively purchasing products. And now art supplies really are quite a bit lower adjusted for inflation. They're, they're pretty affordable. And not to mention, we have the competition of art supplies coming in from China and Korea and um, other countries like Ukraine, uh, Russia. And these paints are equivalent and much more affordable because of the economies in those countries being what they are. We can purchase them for a much lower price than European or domestic products. And, um, I think it has led us to overconsume and overpurchase. And I know that it can be difficult to reckon my ambitions with what I can realistically produce. If I see a sale, I mean, I have to avoid avoid stores sometimes because I know if I see a sale, it's going to be very difficult for me to not buy certain things that I enjoy. Um, and I have to limit myself because uh, like for yarn, for instance, it's like it takes a long time to knit up or crochet up a skein of yarn. And it's a lot easier to buy those products than it is to actually use them. And I think sometimes we feel a bit of satisfaction when we purchase something. It's almost as much satisfaction as we get from completing something, but it's a heck of a lot easier. It's kind of like if you've ever, um, if you've ever been online shopping and it's like a really good sale and you're putting things into your cart, um, I want you to sit and stop and think of the feelings that you are feeling. A lot of times you'll be feeling kind of like a bit of a shopper's high. You'll be feeling this dopamine rush. 
And um, if you can identify that and say, okay, I just enjoyed putting all those things in my cart, but honestly, what can I use? And then backing away, maybe thinking about it for a while, um, you may find that the joy you were getting from that was just the finding it and the inquiring it and that the fact, and you may realize that they aren't things you're actually going to use. But um, we don't realize that a lot of times till the things have already arrived at our house and um, and then they've been on the shelf for a little while. Uh, back in the 80s, when I was a kid, the inspiration I would get for projects that I want to make would generally come from my mother's magazines. It would be like in Family Circle or Women's Day. There would be like usually a craft project in every in every issue, and that would be it. Nowadays, we are confronted by specialty publications. Now, granted, not as many today as there were 10 years ago, but there are magazines that are just about any particular craft that we would want to do. There are blogs about any particular craft that we want to do, countless YouTube videos about any project or craft or anything we're interested in and it can be very overwhelming and it can also feel like we need to have a lot more supplies to create what we want to create and if we compare the craft projects of today both jewelry knitting uh, paper crafting even painting and we compare those to the projects that we would have seen in magazines in the 80s the projects that are coming out today are much more professional looking and they're also a lot more expensive to make and because we see so many people making them it's it becomes normalized that our projects should look like this. They should look like they just came out of a boutique store. And um, in order to do that, we should buy all the things because everybody else is buying all the things. But I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, I think that's a very, that's a very um, kind of, I want to put air quotes here. It's a very first world way to look at uh, handicrafts. When I post a project and I am using up scraps and I'm doing something that's very, um, using everyday projects like newspapers or uh, paper scraps or fabric scraps, plastic bottles, things like that, I notice I get a much bigger um, response and view and commenting from countries like India and Mexico, countries where they don't have as much access to so many supplies, countries where they may not have the um, per capita income to purchase a bunch of new supplies. Now, obviously, some people in these countries can, some can't. It's the same, you know, People struggle in every country to afford different materials, but I do notice a greater uh, a greater amount of viewership from those company uh, those countries when I look in my YouTube analytics, and um, it's just it's just interesting how different parts of the world have shifted a bit in our in our crafting. Another thing that I've noticed over the past, I would say 20 years, is how trendy crafts go in cycles, and it seems like the more um, the more popular a craft starts to get, the more floor space it's going to take in a store. And then the more people will know about it and start buying the supplies to do it. And it kind of spirals and ramps up until it hits peak saturation. Everybody's bought all the things. Nobody needs to buy any more things. So the stores aren't selling as many of these things. So I've seen yarn, jewelry, and scrapbooking go through these, this cycle. Uh, so then when we get to peak saturation, everybody's got a you know, craft room full of these supplies that they haven't used yet. So they stop buying. So then the stores stop selling so much. So then the um, influencers online stop using these products so much and stop sharing so many uh, tutorials with them. And then people can't seem to figure out what to do with their supplies and they sit and then it just kind of like um, declines until the next craft picks up and then the cycle starts all over again. Which is kind of a shame because then what happens after that is that all of these supplies go to yard sales, go to thrift stores, um, go to estate sales. They just they just end up not being used. And it seems that, that the modern crafter and the modern or the modern craft machine or industry relies on this relentless pumping out of product in order to survive. And I've noticed this in the last year and a half or so in the stamping industry, because I, I, I mean, my majority, the crafts that I do majority, major, the majority of the crafts that I do, I should say, tend to be paper crafts. I love paper. I'm a watercolor artist. That's my primary um, type of painting. I do mixed media too, but it, um, I would say if I had to pick one media, it would be watercolor. And even the other types of painting I like to do, I generally prefer paper to canvases and other supports. So um, I'm a paper lover. I enjoy working with paper more than fabric, more than um, panels or boards. It's just something that I've always had a preference for. And um, 
and I noticed that I've noticed in the stamping industry, because stamping is also something I've always enjoyed. Um, I tend to prefer the weird oddball stamps that you find at stamp conventions that, or that were popular before kind of all the cutesy stamps came out. And there's no, I'm not throwing any shade. I think it's I because of the cycle, I know the more people that are that are involved and interested in stamping, it's going to keep um, the hobby popular and it's going to keep stamp shows and stamp conventions in business. It's going to keep the older companies I love in business. Um, and it's going to keep the trend going a little bit longer. But, um, but when I see a lot of people get excited about something all at once, I know that it's going to grow and then it's going to decline. And I think we're in the decline right now. And with the, um, the last year and a half, the pandemic has really crushed a lot of these companies because they're dependent on, getting their dyes made in China. And then they're also combating the um, a lot of the companies in China ripping off their designs and reselling them for much cheaper. So they're fighting with a lot of different uh, a lot of different issues there, plus the declining of interest in rubber stamping as a hobby. It happened with scrapbooking, um, happened with jewelry making. We used to have like three bead stores in my area, and it's not a very large area. The Bangor metro area is not very large, but we had three bead stores when jewelry making was really popular and beading was really popular. But these trends come and go. I can always pick what the what the um, what the popular craft trend is by going into Target and going into the dollar spot because whatever type of project, whatever type of uh, supplies they're showing in there, that's what the hot trend is, and that's the one that's going to be. And it's usually towards the tail end of the hot trend, so it's just about the peak of the of the of the trend. It's like whenever I see something in the dollar spot, I know that that craft is peaking right now and it's going to be starting to decline. Um, it was that way when they were full of yarn. It was that way when they were full of drawer making supplies. It was that way when they were full of uh, stamping supplies. It, that's just a cycle. They tend to jump in at the end when it's the most popular and then it starts declining after that. So uh, if you are still interested in any of these crafts, you should definitely keep doing them. And um, using what you have. I think that we've, it's been so normalized to just go and, um, and buy the latest thing to get the latest look. But as long as you have the basic supplies, you're going to be fine. Something that I've noticed also being super aware of the craft industry for the past 12 years is that everything is cyclical and everything comes back. Um, especially when you're dealing with something like scrapbooking or card making, there's only so many motifs. And after a while, everything gets very repetitive. And I think that's another one of the reasons of the decline. And it's not even that people aren't as interested in pursuing the craft anymore. It's, um, I think it's more of, uh, 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 crafting vein gets hot. And then you've got more companies that that are coming out to push products in that line. So when it was scrapbooking, there were a few companies and then more companies started up and more started up and more started up. And then we're just getting such a glut of products. And then it got to the point where all these companies couldn't survive because there weren't as much, there weren't the uh, customers out there to support so many companies. So they'd start doing more releases. So instead of selling to one com one customer once a year, they're trying to sell to that one customer 12 times a year. And that's what the stamping industry has been doing the last, um, I would say the last three years or so. And you get to a point where the customer's burnt out and they've got so much and they don't need anything. And then they're starting to see the trends recycle through again. And then they're like, well, wait a minute, I already have gnomes from the last time they were popular. I already have, I didn't buy any new gnome stamps for this, this resurgence of the gnome trend because I had them from five years ago. Uh, or I already have cupcakes. I already have owls. I already have llamas. I already have landscapes. I already have all of these different trends. And yes, they may have tweaked them a little bit, but there's nothing really all that new. And then you start to see the companies kind of dropping off because people stop buying so much because they don't need so much because they have so much. So then it's time to start pushing another craft to entice the makers to try something new. And that's where the, the craft stores come in. That's where like the, the Michaels and the Joanne's um, come in. They start saying, okay, paper crafting is trailing off. Let's stop selling dies. Let's stop selling st stamps, which is going to make the, uh, the trend die off faster because people will go into the stores. I think still, um, most of craft purchases are done at these big box stores. So people will go in, they see there's nothing new to, new on offer and they start roaming down the other aisles and something else piques their interest. Maybe they're going to start using an electronic die cutter. Maybe they're going to start doing macrame or sewing or something else. So they're, but they're going to be influenced by 
everything that is being uh, displayed and they're going to see the finished projects and they're going to get that excitement again because we want we we are humans and we love to create and we love to do what's exciting and it's a lot of fun when you're working on a project that other people are doing too i'm telling you when i first started scrapbooking I was, I walked into a scrapbook store when they were having a crop and I just, um, I just introduced myself and I sat down and I started creating and it was so fun to be a part of something that was popular because otherwise I was painting at home by myself and I didn't have a group of artists to hang out with and to paint with. Um, so it was really nice to find this big group of people that were really interested in this thing. It's kind of like, if you can't beat them, join them. Cause I think that's one of the reasons that, um, that people craft is the community of it. You think of the sewing circle and the quilting bee and um, the scrapbooking crops. Sadly, a lot of that has gone away as people have traded going out to a crop or out to a retreat or out to a class for staying home and watching a video and having a craft room at home. The craft room trend is fairly new as well. Uh, it used to be that you'd have like a box of craft supplies and you'd work at your kitchen table. You might invite, um, you know, some family or friends over to join you, but it has morphed into people having separate rooms for their hobby and working in isolation, maybe putting on a video or something like that. I feel like that's what where we are at right now. Um, and a lot of people don't even like to go into their craft rooms because they find it lonely. They're not at the kitchen table with their family buzzing around. Um, I personally like that just because I work from my home studio as part of my business. But if I was just, you know, crafting for fun on the weekends, I think I would like to be in like in and around what my family were doing. In fact, doing my, um, I've been working on Inktober, which is a daily drawing challenge. And I'm doing a lot of those challenges, sitting on the couch or sitting at my desk, being around the rest of my family because I didn't want to be isolated into my craft room. Um, and then I think we're going to hit a point where everybody's filled their spare room up with supplies and then uh, they lose interest because there's nobody else around to share that with. I think, I think other than online, I think the sharing is part of what makes crafting so appealing. Um, so, and the other thing, the, the sharing portion where we're sharing online and we're not just competing or comparing with our friends, we are sharing our work online to be up against professional makers and designers and so we don't want to use the recycled jam jars and the cardboard packaging and all of those things that would be really cool if you sent somebody a card made with these things they would think that was very innovative and awesome but instead it's being compared with uh, professional designers that are using 30 dollars worth of products on their card so if you're going to share it you want to compete with that um you want to keep up with the joneses you want to make sure that your work is up to snuff which means rather than recycling and upcycling, you're buying new and you are competing with that and consuming like that. So that was just a, that was kind of an overview of why I think crafting has gotten away from the um, use it up, wear it out, make do or do without mantra of the, um, you know, of I would say the depression era and probably up through the fifties and moved over to more of a, um, going for a more sophisticated artisanal look where everything can come out perfectly because you have all the supplies and you're putting, you're almost assembling. I feel like crafting has turned to more of an assembly line product. Um, you're going to buy this embellishment that's perfect. You're going to put it on this paper that's perfect. You're going to uh, stamp an image that's perfect. Then you're going to color it with the most high-tech coloring medium so it's perfect. And then you lose a lot of the character and a lot of the individuality. Um, and part of the reason also is because you're being inspired by people online who get paid by selling products. And instead of reading an article in a magazine where the, the author is not making any money other than their, their pay for writing the article, uh, you're getting inspired by that and you're using things from around your house. It's just a whole, uh, whole change in our economy as well. So it has definitely opened our eyes up to more options and um, has encouraged us to consume more. So what can we do? What can we do now that we've had all, we have all these things and we're being influenced by all these beautiful crafts online, which of course, yeah, you, you bought the things, you should use them. I don't want to make anyone feel guilt or shame for buying products. No, um, the best thing you can do now is to use the products that you bought because the most uh, sustainable product you can use is the one that's already in your possession. 
don't go out and buy sustainable paint. Don't go out and buy sustainable paper from sustainable companies. If you already have stuff in your stash, using what you already have, even if it was made in the most polluting factory, in the most um, loosely regulated country, using that product because you already have it is going to be the most uh, green, the most responsible product that you can use because you already have it. And I think as we go into the future, that's where we'll, that's what we'll be doing. I think we'll be using a lot of our stuff up. I have gone through the whole, um, Conmar, Conmari trend, I don't want to say trend, but I went and did a big Conmari clean out a few years ago. And a lot of the stuff I got rid of was a lot of, um, recycled packaging and things like that, that I held on to for so long and realized that I'm really never going to use this. Um, but after doing that, I found that I was much more picky about what I brought into my studio. And I find that I like to use a lot of the same things over and over again. And rather than purging things that I like, that I just have a lot of, I am definitely more inclined to hang on to those things and use them until I've used them completely up. And I want you to think about that rather than just buying a package of something and um, giving it away or throwing it away when you've bought the next thing, maybe consider using up that first package of stuff you bought before you jump onto the next trend. And maybe buy less. If you know that you're probably only going to make one card, maybe you don't want to buy a stamp set in that theme. I've seen so many de-stashes of stamps and papers where the stamp, maybe one stamp in a set has been used or the stamp set's never been used or it's only been used once. And when you're thinking about something like a tool, like a stamp set, think about buying that um, or buying something that you're going to use time and time again, at least like, you know, stamps can be used hundreds of times. That's how you get that cost per use down. So think about getting very versatile things, or maybe if you know it's a theme, you're not really going to use that much more than once or twice. Maybe look online for a digital stamp or look online for a free coloring sheet that you can print out and use on your project. That might be a much more sustainable option. You could have that variety that you want, but you don't have physical clutter. And what's more, you don't have the, um, the, the carbon footprint on it. Or yes, using your computer does create some pollution, but it's nothing compared to manufacturing a stamp set and packaging it and shipping it and then discarding it. So um, we can all be a little bit greener in our craft, I think. I mean, some people are really good already. I think I'm mediocre. Um, but if we keep those things in mind, and not only are we going to save the planet, but we are going to save our budget and um, keep ourselves a lot more financially healthy and um, probably physically healthy too, because we won't be tripping over supplies in our craft rooms or being um, mentally stressed out or disgusted with the amount of things that we have collected and uh and hearted. So that's just my thoughts on those topics. You can let me know what you think uh, in the blog post accompanying this podcast, if you like. I think we're all doing our best, and um, really that's all you can do. But think about those purchases before you make them. And think also, is there something I could use that I already have? Uh, that's generally what I do. Of course, my card making tutorials aren't very popular because I'm not using the, the uh, latest and greatest things these days. Or oh, I would say I'm not using the latest things. I think my things are pretty great that I've uh, collected over the years. And don't be pressured to purchase something just because your favorite YouTuber is using it. Um, make art that is meaningful to you. Um, the people you're sending your cards to, the people you're making your quilts for, the people you're painting for, they don't care when you bought the paint. They don't care what paper you're using. They don't care when the fabric was released. They care that they have something that was made from the heart, made by you. And that's what crafting should be, I think. It's gotten very consumeristic because it's been very popular lately, but it doesn't have to be. And um, be confident in your choices and don't feel pressure to buy the latest and greatest just because somebody you see online is using it. That's all I have to say for today. I want to thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy crafting and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.